I feel so mixed up when I think of him Not wanting safety for my own sake Cause I prefer adventure And I want to share those risks with my friends But it's so different when Ruth comes in She'll be so lonely when I'm up there Oh my darling, what a thrill it is I can't tell you how it possesses me And what a prospect it is The wonder and the beauty of it all Especially when it reminds me of you my wildest dream. When Andrew Irvin received the invitation to join Mallory's 1924 expedition, it couldn't have come at a more opportune time. He just received the news that his best friend Richard Summers had proposed to his sister Evelyn, and he reacted badly to news of their engagement. His own personal life was fast becoming a disaster, involving trips, trysts with wealthy debutantes and accusations of breaches of promise. When, on the eve of their departure, Sandy confessed to George Mallory that he was leaving behind a bloody awful mess to go in search of adventure, Mallory reassured him, adventure is what life means and what life is for. The next day, sailing from the port of Liverpool en route to the Himalayas, Irvin really felt that he had nothing to lose. Goddess of the sky, to make your own angels fly, to the clouds that surround. Your summer crown, oh, the sun and the moon, they rise, they bow to you as they climb their way to heaven, goddess of the sky. Angels fly to the clouds that surround your summer crown. The sun and the moon they shine, they bow to you as they climb their way to heaven, goddess of the sky. Mount Everest is a holy mountain, considered sacred by Tibet to the north and Nepal to the south. To both, she is known as the goddess of the sky. Across her face, the winds blow at 200 miles an hour. Temperatures can reach as high as 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the day and plummet to 60 below at night. In these conditions, climbers can suffer both sunstroke and frostbite in the same day. Near the summit, there is 66% less oxygen. This mountain will literally take your breath away. Cover with the sky, the stars embrace. Snow-tipped, sacred mother, Sagamatha. Man-breaker, fate-shaker, life Breath taker, dream the shadows light across your face, and wake to deeds that leave immortal trace. Her arduum ad astra. We set up camp that night in 
side of the summer I had shaken a blessing Eager to challenge fate Now that we're here On the face of Everest When metal is put to the test All the angels Will attempt this In excelsior <coughs> Creatures without air We're like fish out of water Clinging on to the sides Of the Earth's mother Now that we're here on the face of Everest Where metal is put to the test All the angels would attempt this In excelsior My dream, my quest Nothing else is left Now that we're here On the face of Everest Where metal is put to the test All the angels Would attempt this In Excelsior Sunset on Everest. The daylight fades quickly on their tiny camp as Mallory and Irvin's breath freezes. Despite the cramped conditions, Sandy has set up a make makeshift workspace, just like he did in school. Over here, the ice and snow intrude into everything, whipping at his hands as he checks the apparatus. Well, Sandy, is everything ready for tomorrow? asks George Mallory as much to reassure himself as anything it seems. Ready as it'll ever be, Irvin replies. The conditions on Everest have weathered his face to, as he himself describes, perfect agony. The seeping open blisters and heavy beard make him appear much older than his years. He's suffering from flu and dysentery, for which he's taking laudanum, a powerful opiate it's causing him to hallucinate. Irving drifts in and out of lucidity. Before his eyes, the snow turns red with blood. Scattered around are the butchered remains of a pack of dogs. They belong to Captain Scott. Two ghosts from the explorer's crew now appear. Lost souls with starving faces. Burning up a delirium. Irving takes more of the narcotic. The snow now melts and becomes the ocean. Rocks become icebergs. Everest's summit evokes the shape of the phantom black hull of the Titanic. A huge propeller stark in the moonlight. And around him, in the icy water, echo the screams of the drowning. Scott himself now appears, with pitiful, haunted eyes. He points a frostbitten finger into Irvin's terrified face. And then at his two fallen crewmen. <coughs> Wilson, Powers, whispers Scott, save me. I'm the team of this great experiment, but I'm also its greatest risk. Youth is my only impediment For a challenge like this For it's colder than I've known So hard to swallow The words of Apollo In the ice and snow Oh, the blizzards Kept us at camp for days Mallory, he's living on his nerves He's so desperate to reach the summit stair And for whatever, whatever awaits is there It's colder than I've known So hard to swallow the words of Apollo In the ice and snow 
thought I saw the ghost of Captain Scott. I heard the crying of the dogs. I saw the icebergs rip the Titanic sides. And the screams of the lost. It was colder than I've known. So hard to swallow the words of Apollo in the ice and snow. The ice and snow. Mallory shakes Irvin out of his stupor. He knows he's pushed his friend beyond his limits. His youth is against him, and things seem to hit him harder. Do you have a mind to continue? Mallory pleads. Let's have a whack at it tomorrow, hey George? Sandy reassures him, as best as he can muster. Take me with you When the first light comes When the mountain glistens In the morning sun I won't leave anything to chance Everything is safe in my hands But take me with you Please take me with you Give me this chance There's nothing higher I aspire to and to be on this mountain here with you for you've put your faith in me and nobody else could ever see take me with you take me with you on your wildest dream your wildest the next morning, in the grip of a fitful dream, Mallory cries out, I shan't come back! I shan't come back! Startled, Irvin wakes him. Mallory, it's morning. George, are, are you alright? Yes. Mallory whispers, his throat raw, worried with responsibility. What time is it? It's time, replies Sandy. Under the blue sky, everything's looking good for the attempt. They set out in near perfect conditions. Underfoot is hard pack ice. They must cut steps into the rocks that are steepening around them. And it's time to tie the rope which will act as a lifeline between them, and if it does not save them, will hang them. The day of the ascent had been meticulously planned by George Mallory. He chose Ascension Day, a holy day that symbolizes Christ's rise into heaven. And it takes 40 days and 40 nights for the body to adjust to the altitude on Everest. Let me catch my breath, let me keep my head, let me keep my heart with every step. May the world look up to where we stood, may there be no doubts in the history books, we made our way. On Ascension Day, you and me, the hard way. Ladies and gentlemen, Doug Scott.
as black clouds begin to rise on the glacier far below. The storm then blows across the west face with a ferocity that Maori has never experienced before. Within seconds, thicker, dense waves of ice and snow close in. Huge monsoon clouds encircle the peak. Feeling the advancing gusts, Irvin staggers, snow blind, trying to keep up with Mallory, but forever pushed back by the force of the wind. Team member Noel O'Dell last caught sight of the pair just 300 metres from the top. As they disappeared into the clouds, they resembled tiny black insects on the back of a great white whale. There's only one truth that I've ever known That's when I hear the mountains call I'm behind you, I'm at your side Am I a fool or a hero? Time will decide But I would climb for you Lay my whole life down, I'd die with you at the end of the line. The icy secrets not many men will know, you cling together in this brotherhood of snow I climb this mountain because it's there but now I see its beauty shining everywhere I would climb for you with my whole life now I'd even die with you at the end of the line. The summit pyramid now looms over them. So close, the decision to retreat is unthinkable. Irvin is des desperately trying to follow Mallory's every step. Then, helplessly, Sandy is wrenched forward. <coughs> Collapses face down in the snow. The violent ship drags Irvin downwards, 20 feet, with arms frantically flailing. He manages to gain a hold in the rocks and bring himself to a stop. <coughs> Disorientated, he slowly comes to his senses, just as the rope again cuts into his, deep into his flesh. A split second later, the tension on the, on the line breaks, and he's left motionless, alone. Mallory is <coughs> fallen. All his life he sought after whatsoever things are pure and high and eternal. At last, <clears throat> in the flower of his perfect manhood, he was lost to human sight between earth and heaven on the topmost peak of Everest. I would climb for you Lay my whole life down I'd die Tomorrow, she will break the news to them, and they will cry together. And when the press come calling with their glassy-eyed benevolence, Ruth will allay any hint of hubris in the tragedy. It doesn't matter if George got to the top or not, she says. It was his life that I loved, and still love. The disturbance closed in. As the air was growing thin, the tide rolled of snow. Finally broke. I can almost touch the summit with my hands, but it 
It's all I can do now just to stand The jaws of the wind are closing tight As the sun melts into the night I'm scared to take the next step I'm in the prime of my youth But old enough to know the truth I can only trust what I see As I crawl upon my hands and knees I'm scared to take the next step Frantically, he gathers up the bodiless end of the rope, confirming his worst fears. With no experience to draw on, Irvin desperately tries to negotiate a way down the ledge. He becomes confused, floundering and stumbling in the darkness. Losing his footing, he falls hard, coming to grief on a sheer edge. Shivering, wet and exhausted, he tries to shuffle backwards but slips further into the mouth of a gully. The shivering has stopped, making him even colder as his limbs stiffen. His final thoughts are of his sister, Evelyn, covering him in a blanket. The mountain's crevasses appear to turn into the branches of a tall tree, and through his canopy you can see Evelyn's face smiling. Finally, in a deep sleepiness, his body surrenders and is embraced by the frozen arms of death. Don't look down If you're frightened, hold me tightly Till we're on the ground Evelyn Don't look down When you're climbing, you can end up crying Where wonders, wars, misfortunes And staring deeds are seen where peace and wild confusion have come and gone again. I could ride with Robin Hood or Ranulph, Earl of Chester, England's ancient blood, its shield and its protector. But greater strife the country bore, wide wasting land and kin, and lads had died in mud and gore that hid the kind old son. Now nature generation shows and young men take their place, and noble is as noble does when scions pick up the pace. Like Gawain and Bayard, noble knights of old, modesty their standard for quests and ventures bold. Call then the far dominions with bitter frosty skies, the devil's dark pavilions where demons hiss their lies. And though their mothers scheme and urge them not to go, they smile and explain the answer must be no. Before they reach that shore, what promises they made, and how high country's store was stopped with glory's tread. Now huntsmen take their places, and all the hounds run free, as bloods up, honour paces swift to crack and shifting scream. Those lads, their eyes grown bright, would soar, surmount the way, climbing on with great delight as sets the end of day. Bold Mallory, unflinching, drew his pick and staked his claim. His mind's eye upward flew, the summit set to be his aim. Then Irvin said, with cheerful face, Why shrink back from the quest? 
Though fate bring glory or disgrace, a man must meet the test. Life can only little mean with loss so much in mind. All faults they may redeem through fellowship in kind. Spin the prayer wheel letters, tell of ancient noble truths. Their story flagged in penance, the mountain people choose. One cannot say if Sandy Irvin fully understood the risks of the Everest expedition. He was the youngest by 15 years and the last member to be chosen. A choice part justified by his good humour, his keenness and ready cheerfulness. It is certain that the Irvin family didn't fully appreciate what Sandy was getting into. They were completely broken by the tragedy, especially Evelyn. After his death, the garland that Sandy had picked for her during the climb was forwarded to her by his Sherpa. It consisted of blue alpine violets. His father, William, always maintained that his son had reached the summit before he died. Equally firmly, Evelyn was convinced he did not. If he had, she said, he would have come back to me. Let me catch my breath. Let me keep my head. Let me keep my heart with every step. I made the world look up to where we stood. May there be no doubts written in the history books. We made our way on Ascension Day. You and me. The hard way. What bloom survives under the eyes? Whose breath is iron? Whose fingers knives? And love's terrain is much the same. The crystals form on every word we say. We made our way on Ascension Day, you and me, the hard way. Love don't let me fall, please love don't let me fall. Let us leave him to 
his wildest dream. Only human, as human can be, he saw no obstacles, only possibilities. But he could not make the final descent. Stones, 
and against every cave there's a, a building on the outside, an infrastructure marking it as um, a place where some ancient sage, sage saint uh, once meditated, people like Miller April, Guru Rinpoche. And you'll always pass, I'm calling it to Tangboche Monastery as you go towards Everest. Certainly all our Sherpas go in there to get the Lama's blessing. Then we move on to their highest village of Kumjung and Kundi, where they're so acclimatized to the lack of oxygen, of which there's only about uh, half in the atmosphere is here. Um, I never expected to go to Everest, I never thought about going to Everest. Uh, all through my sort of early teens and twenties I was uh, more into climbing um, rock climbing and going to big walls in uh, Baffin Island and, and northern Norway. But you couldn't escape the fact that Everest was often in the news because it had been right through the 20s and 30s. And I think that for that reason, the British public are more sophisticated about Mount Herring than most other countries, certainly than, say, Americans. But for all of us, in recent times, Everest became more and more in the news as, um, I think, the first climb in 19, 1953 by John Hunt's team going up here. Every intensity taking off on the 29th of May and reaching the summit. Uh, and the, the fact that it happened, it was announced just um, during the coronation, but it was um, brought it to everyone's sort of domain. After that, the North Ridge was climbed, the one that Mallory and Irvin may well have climbed, who knows. But um, the, the, the uh, Chinese, with mainly Tibetans, uh, reached the summit by the North in 1960, and then came the turn of the Americans to climb a much harder route on the west flank, with Tom Hornbein and Willie Unsold leaving the end of their fixed road and going up unknown ground here, pitch after pitch, up very steep, uh, uh, brittle rocks and, and difficult to get belays and just kept on pressing on at what's now known as the Hornbein Co-op, and then Realising it's going to be very difficult to ever upsail back down, because we couldn't find anchors, but upsailing. They carried on over the top, traversed the mountain, made the first travellers. They were part of a bigger expedition, um, and with men spare, to go around this way, to give them some support. And when Tom and Willie, having gone from here, over the top, for sunset, down here in the dark, when they came across the support party, they found them all frostbitten. And next day they ended up rescuing the rescuers, <laughs> which uh, made it a real tour de force, that one. So, you may not have heard of Tom and Willie before, but they were uh, two of the finest Himalayan climbers ever. Um, to, to this day, to my mind, that is the most committing um, climb ever made on the mountain. Well, after the steeper ridges have been climbed, and, and, and the steep buttress, then came the turn of the face. This is the general development of all mountains, climbing-wise. Uh, and the only face available was the southwest face, basically. First attempt in 1969 by the Japanese, who thought the best way through this big rock band, about uh, 12 to 1,500 foot band of rock stretching across it, was on the left side. But subsequently, uh, two more Japanese teams and the big international brigade of 1971 all went up that way. Uh, leered up to um, higher by this snow ramp but ending up in a cul-de-sac. Dougal Haston and Don Burns were here for a couple of weeks, unable to get through such a uh, steep rock. Well, as I say, I was not expecting to go there, but um, I, 1972, in the spring, I, um, I taken early retirement from teaching after 10 years and was doing casual building work. In fact, I had nothing on at all at the time and the phone rang. In fact, I was in the bath uh, when this man rang me up to see if I wanted to go to Everest. I said yes. I uh, asked him when. I have been in three weeks. Got to look sharp. This is Don Willans from Salford. Um, and Don, a very forthright chap, had no hesitation in saying when I asked him, um, can we cope with the leader of this expedition, 
uh, which turned out to be a Dr. Karl Herlikofer. So it was a German European expedition. And, and Karl had a bad reputation among climbers. Um, he, he himself wasn't a climber, he was um, an entrepreneur that, that did give a lot of Austrian and German climbers the chance to go to the mountains for the first time. But, um, he usually ended up taking one or two of them to court on the things they wrote about him. A very sensible <laughs> song. Uh, here is the, uh, the doctor looking perplexed. That's because all the Sherpas have gone on strike. Um, they, um, they weren't happy with blankets and, and uh, jumpers. They wanted sleeping bags and duvets. So, unbelievably, the, the doctor took a helicopter out of base camp and eventually flew back to Munich to his stores to bring out the proper equipment, uh, telling Felix Kuhn that um, he, he was now in charge, there's Felix, and that Don could be the climbing leader. The only problem was that these two didn't like each other. Victory. <laughs> in fact, Don didn't like any of the Germans. Uh, since they dropped uh, bombs on his, uh, his road in, in South <laughs> I have to say that uh, uh, Hamish and myself uh, got on fine with it. Uh, most, most of these journals are just ordinary uh, down to earth climbers and, and okay, but uh, there was this tension between these two. And actually, we were in this tent for about a week in really bad weather at 20,000 feet. When Felix was playing around with the radio, I got all in the radio giving out the report of the European football results that year. On the 28th of April, it turned out that uh, Germany had beaten England 3-1 <laughs> at, at Wembley. And this really amused Felix. In fact, he was quite triumphant about it. I said to Don, ah, so villains, we beat you at your national game. Well, it took Don just two seconds. He said, aye, but we beat you at your national game twice. <laughs> <laughs> Not a happy expedition. <laughs> In fact, it all fizzled out up here, uh, again, under the rock band. Um, I think we, we got somewhere up here that never actually reached the rock band. Um, about four months later, Hamish and myself were back here with Chris Bonington's first expedition to the face. Here is Chris looking down onto the base camp and the ice fall. <coughs> so we're, we're back here for another go. Not Don, Chris had fallen out with Don by then. <laughs> I was in North Wales when this happened. When he was dropped and done, just uh, uh, was drowning his sorrows, and people were giving him pints. And he, he must have had about 20 pints that afternoon, evening, one wet weekend. And um, it was, I was at the bar when someone said, Why do you drink so much, Williams? And uh, Don turned to him and said, with his bleary eyes, and, Well, I've got this morbid fear of dehydration. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I have to say that most of us missed out. Uh, his, his wise uh, ways in the mountains, he had, he had more Himalayan experience than anyone. But uh, it was no good if um, Chris, who was the leader, and Don couldn't get on, so he was probably rightly dropped. Well, this was going out in 72, uh, a Daily Express photo. Uh, myself and, and Beth Burke, Nick and Nick Burke, <coughs> in the um, Customs trying to get cameras out and Don, uh, here's Dougal, uh, Nick Escort, to Graham Tizer, Barney Rosedale, our doctor, and Hamish and Chris, and just Dave Bathgate and one to others. Well, I um, got to know quite a lot more about the mountains during the 72 trip. The main thing was the incredible winds and the effect of the altitude on your limbs and extremities. It's, in the Alps in winter and the Cairngorms in winter, we know where to stop and warm up. Um, but here, you suddenly find it left, left it too late, and, and the frost is, it, it, your hands aren't warming up, and the frost has got a grip, and you've got frost in it like this. Those fingers will recover, but if you've left it really too late, it's gone right down into the palm of the hand, and then you'll lose your finger. So easy to happen, especially on your early visits to, the, to altitude. And the spins are very demoralizing. Uh, collapsing tents through the night in the western coup, drifting snow around, uh, causing rocks to fall down the face. These are supposed to be square box tents. 
Um, so Graham Tajo was cooking up in this one uh, in 1972 when a rock came through the roof, sliced through his head, and went on through the opposite wall of the tent. That's the rock, of course, not his head. He was leaving very good crust. And uh, here's Barney anaesthetizing the wound before he probably did the highest stitching there that there'd ever been. Um, the other thing was the ice falls, it was incredibly dangerous. Just after I took this photograph and came down, um, up and, and then down the ice about uh, half an hour later, there was a big rumble in, in, in the whole ice fall. And up here, that uh, broke off on that fracture line, and that all came tumbling down to that ladder as Tony and I was crossing it. We all rushed back up after the Sherpas had told us what happened. And, um, couldn't find his body, which was buried under too much ice. So in 72, we came down from that point. I was up there with Doodle on the 14th of November, uh, far too late, screaming into each other's ears over the winds. Uh, my, my main question was, where's the route? Because um, when he pointed up here, I thought, oh, that doesn't go very far. But, you know, it, that's not really in line with the sort of uh, way we want to go. Uh, and it certainly couldn't get up here, not in those winds. That's about 1,500 foot, a very steep rock. So anyway, we came down this, uh, this kind of false trail, and from there we could see into the gully on the left, the one the, Chinese, uh, the, one the Japanese had looked at in 69. From here, we could see there was more or less snow all the way up here. And with the snow, you can see a man can go, providing there's an avalanche. And we, and we thought, well, that's the way to go next time. And of course, it was the next time when Chris booked it for 75. So why, um, I think, seven expeditions had all gone that way, I can't think. As you can see, it leads off the route, really. <coughs> but anyway, Chris had lots of time to plan for this one. And uh, he managed to persuade Bartlett to underwrite the trip. And they went, he went on signing checks till he totaled about 114,000. Um, I should tell you that Barclays doubled the investment. We got just double that back from the book, um, film rights, and uh, we, we lectured for them for uh, about six months. So, uh, but they took the risk. The chairman of Barclays was um, being grilled by a young Jeremy Paxman at the time, uh, asking him why he was spending his customers' money on so something so frivolous as climbing a mountain when the country's Debt was soaring, and there were strikes, if you remember, the mid 70s, and IRA bombs were going off. And here you are, denying your customers the chance to invest in British industry on a mountain. And uh, anyway, the chairman stuck to his guns and the backed us all the way, and it did pay off. The gear was all sent out ahead. Here's the team, new boy on the block, Peter Borman, Sal, Doodle, and Chris, um, all in the style of the early 70s. Um, <laughs> Another new boy is uh, uh, Paul Braithwaite, Chuck Braithwaite, one of our finest halpinists at the time. Both, um, both Pete and, and Chuck really were to help my climber. Chuck had been with us to Pamir, to, um, yeah, Pamir the year before. Um, so he had been up to 23,000 before. And uh, we knew to go in earlier, to walk in during the monsoon, so we can take advantage of that period just afterwards, when there's a lull in great wind systems of Asia, that is, before the westerlies come back and start to hammer the mountain. It's a bit dreary though, walking in the monsoon. Not to be written off. Um, between storms and showers, there's a sort of vibrancy to the landscape, and there's rainbows, and, and you won't find anyone else there walking in the rain. You can walk to yourself, and on each other. They get everywhere. Here we are uh, in a tea house, I mean Chang, and usually we were also imbibing local local herbs on the walk in. Just to relax us completely. <laughs> <laughs> magic swirling ship. This is across there doing cozy, which rose in joy the monsoon and swept that bridge away. The gear's all gone ahead along that trail. And when we got up to Kumjung, we found the Sherpas had already got it stored away in those houses. We spent two or three days here uh, trying to get ourselves a physiology like the Sherpas have, the same kind of blood count. Which takes about three weeks. After three weeks, you really do feel like climbing. 
until then it's pretty awful, you know, headaches, insomnia, nausea. Just as um, I, after three weeks, it's fine, I'm not an expedition, but when you're trekking, just as you're getting fit, you've got to come home. <laughs> no wonder with all the uh, tragedies on the mountain, two of the people then died dead on it. One, well, the chance of getting killed were in ten. No wonder then that the Sherpas erected this shrine and would walk through the burning juniper smoke, uh, chanting there, on my padmium, on my padmium, endlessly as they walk through, and some of them uh, shifting their rosary beads. We took it in turns to work our way up through the ice fall, which is about two and a half thousand feet high, about two miles, one figure and out. And the Sarax, this is near the top where it's easing off, and there's Dougal. We found a place for camp one, but it was difficult to get off it. Uh, so Hamish was called in to build this bridge. <coughs> Hamish, being a, uh, an engineer, made stretches for a living at the time, uh, made this very ingenious bridge. You can see the tension ropes against, against the tension bar, stop the whole thing sagging. It took him ages to do it, and just as he finished, we found an easy way around there. <laughs> 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 And the other problem, of course, is um, if you get too close to Nutsi, you're going to get hammered by uh, avalanches every now and again. So that was always a big worry that the whole team of Sherpas and ourselves might get wiped out for one of these. So we tried to keep down the centre of the Western Coombe, which is a magnificent valley, really. And uh, there's Dougal approaching the face. See it better here. Um, so we're going to go from Camp 2, 3, Camp 4, and Camp 5 out here. Steady build up. Um, it's a typical siege style expedition, this, with fixed ropes between camps and teams going up to put in supplies, and when there's enough, move on to the next one. Uh, some, some call it the polar method of climbing. But um, I must say, once, it, once we were getting fit in the climb times, it was rather wonderful to be at Camp 4, every room with a view. Sitting there in your tent door with a mug of tea, watching the sun go down over Pumori. And then on to Camp 5. It was going up there that uh, Ang um one of our Sherpas who was over a week before last for our big, um, big lecture at the Royal Geographic Society, was telling me that it was going up there that he suddenly saw this great slough of snow coming down, big avalanche of snow. And yelled yeah, Hamish, who was just in front of him, uh, a warning. And Hamish looked up and just hit him straight in the face. And he got all this snow to the powder snow to his lungs. And was off the expedition from then on. He never recovered. There is Camp 5. Uh, two tents up, going up. Uh, it looks a bit precarious, but actually it's safe from avalanche. And they are well tied on to ice cream. Uh, screwed deep into the solid ice under the snow. Eventually there were six tents all in line here. It's from here that the rock band is going to be attempted on the left. And Tutton took Red Weight and Nick Escort were given the task of doing that. So they're coming from the camp there across into the um, gully. Uh, Chris, Ryan Rich and myself have gone up to the foot of the rocks and they're going to come up now and, and go on. You can see all the Sherpas coming up and, and climbers stocking that camp, ready for a summit push once the rock band, once the rock band has been climbed. So, just to show you again, they're going from there across into there. Got to go to Camp 6 there. No one's managed that. Uh, this is the 7th seventh, seventh expedition, actually, this one. Uh, will this be the one? <coughs> well, there's Tut and Nick going out across very difficult ground. This is powder snow on very compact rock, so it's hard to get a peg in for protection. Very easy to slip off, slip off that and go quite a long way. And they kept to the right hand side of the building because it is itself an avalanche chute. Described the climbing as something like grade 3, 4 Scottish. And then Nick. Uh, went out on the right was out of the gully by that ramp. His oxygen packed up, although his bottle was still in his frame rucksack, and he's got to climb under that overhanging wall above him. 
So it was being pushed off balance all the time by that and the sack. And this was the hardest pitch on the whole climb. And they got to as far as they could uh, before they had to re retreat, knowing that it, it had more or less, they more or less found the way to the upper snow fields. Came back down to Camp 5, where Dougal and I were preparing to go up and have first go at the summit. Chris had selected us probably because we were the only two fit that had been there before, twice, and we were luckily fit. Had to have any diarrhea or anything on the walking. Um, so we we're going to have the first crack at it. Chatting to Nick, and he, he ended up his description by saying, Oh, by the way, just watch that last 200 foot of rope. It can only tie to one peg, about half an inch in the rock. <laughs> Don't pull too hard on it. Um, so anyway, Dougal shot off, and I was still fiddling around with my back in my bag. And uh, I could hear Chris on the radio, walkie talkie, low down talking to uh, uh, Camp 2 in the Western Coombe, and suddenly emerged to say, my God, my back end is collapsing. What well, that's nasty up here. <laughs> but it wasn't that. It was uh, that there were so many fit lads on the trip, and they hadn't been placed in the sort of next, the, the, the third, fourth, and fifth teams to have a go at the summit. So there was a bit of dissension. Just one of the problems that the leader would have to deal with. And, we, and Chris did deal with it quite sensitively. After us, Mick Berg, um, Martin Boyson, Patemba, and, and uh, Pete Ball would be the next team to have a go. So I we went up the gully. It was quite interesting actually, having been on the open slopes of Everest many times before, to suddenly be in the mountain, this giant cleft. And uh, Dougal dropped back there, his Crampons are coming off his spongy overboots. This is not the best place to be sorting out your crampons at 27,000 feet. Um, this is Ang Ferber, who's coming up, carrying our tent. And there is Vilay Dugal, and paying the rope out for me, as I'm hurriedly trying to find a site for Camp 6, since Ang Ferber's got all the way down here. He never got a chance to climb up on our trip. Things cooled off when McBurk uh, disappeared. But he was there the following year with the Korean expedition in 1976 when the Korean leader collapsed above the Hillary Step uh, only 10 minutes from the summit really and Hank Ferber could have so easily left him there and nipped up to the top and got Everest on his CV which would have looked really good when it came to getting uh, jobs with the foreigners later but he just didn't think about that all he could think about was getting his companion down and he got his shoulder under the guy's arm and going down the Hillary Step, and next day, having spent a night out, back to the South Cole without the Korean getting frostbite. It saved his life. And that's the kind of guys we had working for us on those sea style expeditions in the, in the 70s. In the prime, it's as if a Sherpa could do anything about it. And, uh, would, and he, he would do anything to help you out with when the chips are down. It would always go an extra mile, more so than, in the, than your own teammates. That's, of course, the fitter. But also, there's something about them that really are very caring people deep down. Although we keep hearing things about them these days, fights on Everest and uh, becoming greedy and so on, but really, in truth, uh, their material expectations are just catching up with ours. So, so I went up here about 300 foot to that little point there. It wasn't quite right, so I carried on up here and uh, found a, a reasonable place for a, a camp. There's Dougal coming up, climbing all the way in sponge, <laughs> sponge over the near me. Uh, and we chopped into this uh, rib of snow, soft snow, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, made a platform. Just as we got that done, uh, four Sherpas came up with vital loads. And then Chris, Mike Thompson, and Mick Berg. Then we went back down. Mike was the last. He'd never been anywhere like this before, not at 27,400 feet. And uh, I yelled my thanks as he went down. And he just said, he just turned and I said, just get up, it's all the thanks I need. And that sums up the whole trip, really, that it, it was a huge team effort, this. And uh, things so well led by Chris that were well ahead of schedule, helped on by good weather, but mainly by.